Well, I'd like to start by thanking CDU for setting this up and uh, thank you all for showing up today. Um, a few of us already, well, we met, so I'll have to bore you <laughs> with a little bit of my background. Um, first of all, I, uh, I didn't think I would be doing this for the rest of my life, but I certainly do now. Um, I started out with acting in Hong Kong, and that kind of gave me a step up to be able to help raise awareness. So uh, I think about 30 years ago, I started working on chameleons, and I didn't think I was doing conservation work then, but um, I definitely was. And uh, about 15 years ago, I got involved with shark fins. And I remember at the time, my mother laughed in my face. She's in San Francisco. And she basically said, you want to get the Chinese to stop eating shark fin? Pack. It's never going to happen. Well, I think that it's happening in a very big way. Um, throughout Hong Kong and the south of Asia, we're seeing at least a 90% drop in shark fin consumption. So together, we've made this happen. Um, so, you know, since then, I've gotten involved with um, trying to figure out where I can make a difference in conservation. Uh, thankfully, I've had a lot of people that I admire greatly um, lend me a hand and show me what I can do. Um, with Upper Meridian, so this is a Hong Kong-based NGO, I basically try to get uh, the public to realize what we can do to make a change. Uh, what we've been doing or taking from the wild that we should stop doing. So let's move this on a little bit. How do I go to the next one? No finger here. <laughs> well, that's going on. All right. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, let me put this. There we go. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I have met with some very interesting situations doing um, all of my campaigning things. Uh, in Hong Kong, I've gone into situations where I've had to call the police, gone into relatively physical situations. Um, that's with shark fin, and then when it got to uh, ivory, um, it got even worse. I started getting death threats. <laughs> and I'm still not getting this to work, though. Those little arrows? Yeah. This? So just press here, and it will... I could just click that. Here, here. There's, there we go. All right. Let's, let's go to ah, okay. So um, now to me, this is, I find this very fascinating and interesting. So I just like to share this. Looking back at Hong Kong's past history, if you look at these pictures, um, there's a fellow here by the name of John Fortune, this fellow here. Uh, he's still with us, but this picture was taken in 1952, if I remember correctly. And look at look at what we see here. Now this picture was um, was taken with a Calypso camera. It's a horrid little camera. It's it's definitely an antique, and you have to change your light bulbs underwater. And you you know every time you use it, the light bulb's gone. And he told me, John told me, he just tossed the light bulb underwater and plugged another one in. So we're still doing that with our oceans, pretty much. We still toss a lot into our oceans. But you think about this picture. Now, these fish are not going to stand still for the photo. And in the 50s, we had that sort of an environment in Hong Kong, schools and schools and schools of fish. So um, that has changed, of course. I'm not seeing that little. <laughs> Where did it go? Ah, there we go. All right, so we used to fish using using this sort of a vessel. And um, I did a bit of research, met up with some very old timers that used to fish in Hong Kong and learned from them. It was quite fascinating. They Most of these people didn't even write in those days. So they passed down their knowledge via poetry. So they would teach the youngsters um, where and when to fish for what species of fish through poems that were easy to remember. 
And for example, if they were out looking for Chinese bahaba, um, also a type of drum, a drum fish, a croaker, they would, these people, the fishermen would, would put their ears on the wood of the hull. Like they would just put their ear there and they would listen. And that was their GPS in those days. So they would, they would listen for the sounds the croaker made because a drum fish, they, they had the swim bladder that would uh, rub against their skin and it would emit this almost like a drumming sound, like, <clears throat> and you could hear it. So they would know that the fish was down there and they would cast their nets. And of course, in those days, you only had manpower. Now, this was the last croaker of this size that we know that was caught. And it was caught in uh, 1994, if I remember correctly. And this beautiful fish sold for, at the time, 3 million Hong Kong dollars. Right. So there's a good reason why they're disappearing. People caught them for this, the dried swim bladders. And um, it's, it's, I just don't get it. But, uh, you know, talking to these families from old fishing villages, they would tell me that they would keep these bladders and never eat them. And they would be used as dowry when their daughters got married. It was that important to them. Yeah, they, they prescribed all sorts of, I would say, even magical abilities. I mean, if you ate it, you would, you know, live longer or I don't know what else, but, you know, it's, it's a swim bladder. Um, so now, uh, thankfully, we know that this fish is still around. The Chinese Bahaba has survived our overfishing. They're slowly but steadily rebounding. Um, Alpha Meridian's gotten involved with the government in a sense. We've um, put together the Hong Kong South Hope Spot. That's 41,000 hectares of protected ocean. And uh, a lot of people are working together to look after this. So um, there's a number of issues that needs to be addressed from boat traffic to trash to chemical spills, all sorts of things. And so many people are working on it together. So, but um, why we, we ended up with a collapse of our fisheries is of course you look, you know, in, in the eighties, it was still all right. The nineties, nineties, we were using purseiners and the nets that we used, uh, the holes are smaller than, than this coin here, 10 cent pieces. So what can escape that? And purse seniors would scrape along the ocean floor. It would pretty much take everything from corals to uh, fry, you know, very small fish and shrimp. And we ended up with a lot of bycatch. And basically what you see here, it's all thrown away. Because by the time the fishermen go through what they've caught, these would have died and they would be tossed aboard, overboard. Um, so Aqua Meridian, we've tried to work on um, endangered species. So sharks, that's some of them are endangered now, and we're pushing for more of that uh, via each IUCN meeting. Um, a lot of people don't realize it, but the pumphead brass you see here, this is a female still. Um, they're endangered as well. So they become this. And this is a very rare photo taken by a professor in Palau. So you can see the females come out through, through the reefs and they spawn and it gets fertilized. And that's the new generation of humphead rats. And for something that small to become this big male here, it's just against so many odds. So if you're a diver, if you go diving, if you've had an experience with a hermit wrasse, it's magical. And to see them just disappearing. And we used to have these in Hong Kong. So I hear from some divers that they've seen some return. I don't know whether these are um, releases. Releases aren't usually successful because you bring them from different waters. They go through a lot of trauma. They may not survive. But anyway, there are a few here in Hong Kong now, and hopefully, we look after them carefully. The females need to be left alone and we do need our coral communities very much in order for these to survive. So that's me with, uh, with my friend in Palau. <laughs> yeah, there were, um, at the time when I visited Palau, there were supposed to be eight large males on the islands that yeah, people named them, but over one Chinese New Year, four were gone. 
So um, yeah, we have to be very careful with that. So shark fin's another issue that we worked on. And we do take everything from the smallest fins to the largest. Um, various pictures taken in Hong Kong. That obviously is a whale shark. Here you have a great white. These are endangered sharks. That's a whole rooftop of shark fins. And uh, this happens every day in one little fishing village in uh, Japan. So as far as I know, this is still going on. Now, at least the ones that we see here, all of this, it gets used, okay? The, the cartilage, the whole shark, it gets used, gets made into pills. Um, the fins are, of course, used, but this is the tip of the iceberg. We have many times this that are just being thrown out into the oceans every day. We're fishing with long lines and uh, the sharks don't, don't have a hope. So we're working very hard on saving them. So <clears throat> one of the things I do a lot of is um, I go to a lot of primary schools. I do a lot of education with kids. I like to show these pictures. I share with them and the kids have lots of questions to ask. And I believe that inspiring the young and educate them and educating them is very, very important at this point. Um, this is what the whale sharks were eating. So there's an aggregation of about uh, 600 of them every year in Isla Mujeres. So that's in Mexico. Um, another thing that we educate about is our sea turtles that migrate through Hong Kong. They used to nest quite often in Shenwan. So we've uh, lobbied for and managed to extend the protected area in Shenwan but we don't have enough people policing the area. We don't have enough people penalizing the area. And what happens to that area is um, these turtles want to come to land to the beach to lay eggs, but before they make it, they get hit by jet skis, by pleasure crafts, um, by general traffic. So a lot of them don't make it. Every year we do find dead sea turtles ashore and a lot of them would have sunk and we wouldn't have found them. Uh, the other thing, of course, would be what they eat looks like trash. So a lot of sea turtle deaths are being contributed now to them eating trash. And it's not so much just the plastic bags. A lot of it would be the lines and especially the hooks from fishing. So this gets really tangled in their guts. And septicemia sets in. They die a painful, terrible death. Um, yes, we have trash, all kinds of trash. And, of course, ghost nets that we need to... Uh, deal with in Hong Kong. Straws, of course, um, and plastic. You see the fish here, they do eat the straws. This is how the fish, you know, the, 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 the shape of the mouth, they eat the straws. We end up eating a lot of this plastic that we dump into the oceans now. I, I read a study somewhere that even in this, the salt that we eat every day, there's plastic in it now. So I don't know what that's doing to us, but a lot of us are getting sick, cancers, uh, unexplicably. So I think we need to address this problem. So um, this is uh, the ivory situation in Hong Kong that we worked on. Um, this is one of the seizures. And as you can see, other than these big tusks, there were tiny, tiny tusks as well. So the poachers were pretty much taking everything that they can. Um, one of the things that we try to educate um, using would be, you know, addressing the, the point that we're taking these tusks that came from animals that died a horrible death, and we're making deities out of them. This is the goddess of mercy. So this is Guan Yin. So I, that seemed a little bit wrong to me. But uh, anyway, successfully, we, we've uh, banned the Hong Kong um, elephant ivory trade. So... Um, now, since COVID set in, I've noticed that a lot more people have been keeping pets in Hong Kong. And parrots are in danger generally. So we uh, got involved with parrots, again, by accident. I didn't do this on purpose. First, it's noticing a few people saying they've lost their birds in Facebook. So off I go because I happen to be free. I'm climbing trees. I'm falling off of trees. I'm helping people. <laughs> Find their parents. Um, so the point is to educate people so they don't lose their birds. 
Most of the people buying parrots in Hong Kong have no idea what they're getting into. They see someone with a parrot, they think, oh, how cute, I want one too. And they don't realize this is not a dog or a cat. This is something that lives a much longer life. They are a handful. They will break everything in the house if they can. Um, they'll you know, kill all your wiring. They will scream at the top of their lungs for hours if they don't have the attention that they need. So people need to be educated before they get a parrot, not after. Sadly, that hasn't been the case. Um, we've also gotten involved with our wild parrots in Hong Kong. In fact, I was hoping I could find someone at City U that might be interested in um, conducting a, a future survey, because I know survey's been done, but I think that we are losing our wild cockatoos. So the last survey that was done was several years ago, and I do know that there have been people illegally taking these birds. They climb trees, they climb at all hours of day. The government actually hires, they outsource people to trim trees. Um, and then of course, there are people that sweep garbage and so on, they get involved. Um, I try to get feelers out and I have discovered that yes, they do take these birds. Our cockatoos are, um, they are endangered and they are quite rare because they come from Indonesia, and where these birds came from, we've lost most of them. So the ones that we have in Hong Kong are the ones that we really need to look after. Um, having them in the pet trade is not a terrible thing, but we're taking them from the wild too much. So if people already have them in the pet trade, if they keep those in the pet trade, that's not an issue. But we need to find the people that are taking them from the wild. We need to penalize. We need to deal with them. So this is a baby that, um, that happened at St. Stephen's School in Hong Kong. I got a call. This baby kept falling into the middle of the road. It literally just fell off the tree several times into the middle of the road. So I got called by the school and I went there and um, the typhoon was coming in. So I took the baby in. I kept him for 10 days, fed him, fanned him up, and I put him back. So this is a day when I put him back and the parents were there waiting, so he survived it, and he managed to go back into the wild. So that was that was a very happy ending for me. But uh, yeah, this is the calls that I got uh, to go pick up the bird. So that's them today. Um, we do have problems with trees sometimes falling. And uh, they're taking down the tree at St. Stephen's. So I went to the school and I, I had a talk with these girls there. There were 600 kids there that day. And I explained that, yes, they're taking the tree where the cockatoos nest, but that's okay. There are other trees nearby because otherwise it would be a danger to the school. But what's important is um, inspiring the children and making sure that they understand that to respect life and conserve nature is a very, very important thing. Um, before going into keeping any pet, to know that what they're doing is the right thing first. This was at one rescue that I get calls out of the blue. There happened to be a reporter with me that day, so they filmed it. So this was at a school in um, near Taikushing. And for some reason, there were two lovebirds on the loose flying around. So now lovebirds are not endangered, uh, neither are cockle teals, but still we, we are getting too many backyard breeders. This is an issue that needs to be addressed. I don't see anyone doing anything about it yet. What's wrong with backyard breeding is when you actually want to breed your parrots, you need to make sure that they are in very, very good physical shape because it takes a lot out of the hens to make eggs. It takes a lot of these out of these animals to raise their young. Backyard breeders can raise up to three or four clutches from their birds in a year. And you end up with chicks that are malnourished, um, that have lots of problems. So I'm seeing a lot of this happening in Bird Street in Hong Kong. Um, I'm hoping that 
I could get more help to somehow deal with what's going on in Bird Street because um, uh, this is another rescue. But at Bird Street, I'm seeing um, improper use of medicines, antibiotics. Um, they're using poultry antibiotics on parrots. They're just copiously putting it into the water that the birds drink. And this is causing a lot of very big health issues. People are buying very sick birds without realizing it. Um, this whole thing needs to be addressed. And um, this is another irresponsible owner who lost a bird and uh, it ended up with me. So the person lives in a village with lots of cats, lots and lots of cats. And um, they have this African gray that's had its wings clipped. And the gray, of course, learned how to open his cage, as most African grays would do. So, yeah, thankfully, this bird survived, and uh, she's with me now still. And uh, she's very traumatized. She hasn't grown her feathers back from here yet. So her body's still kind of just downy looking right now. And she still is very traumatized. She has nightmares. I know this because she sleeps on my pillow sometimes. And she just wakes me up. She, you know, has nightmares. So people, has, they have to realize that these are very intelligent animals and uh, to treat them accordingly. So what I'm hoping that the Hong Kong Parrot Rescue ends up doing is um, educating, getting people to learn more about parrots before they buy them. And in cases such as this one here, um, we deal with it. So this is an interesting story. I got called to a village in Dai Wai. And uh, this old lady um, had passed away. She had COVID. Her last call outside of, uh, to, to reach someone outside of the hospital was to ask someone to make sure her bird was looked after. And this bird's name is Georgie. And I was called. So I went to their house. And this couple, they never got uh, any children. They got married in the 70s. And I saw this picture, this picture right here. And I looked at the guy's sideburns and I thought, wait a minute, that looks like a photo from the 70s. And if it were 70s, there was only Ocean Park importing these birds. So um, I grew up at Ocean Park. So I called one of these old trainers who knew me since I was a few years old. And I said, Angie, do you remember uh, this fellow? And I told her the name and I talked about the birds and she says, oh yeah. So the first birds that came into Hong Kong, the first macaws were 15 of them. And five of them were bought on behalf of friends. Two went to this fellow who was a British soldier and he ended up falling in love and settling down in Hong Kong. And the red one had flown off, but he kept the blue one all this time. And the funny thing is I ended up with this bird because the person that imported this bird was actually my father <laughs> over 50 years ago. Yeah. So anyways, yeah, people need to realize that parrots um, are very sensitive, emotional animals, and they need to learn about that before they get one. Um, I do have a number of distressed animals at home that I'm looking after right now. They're steadily getting out of their problems. I have one mulligan at home, that this one. Um, his owner had a stroke three months ago, and then immediately he fucked himself naked. Um, so he's now on Valium plus other things. And hopefully he'll pull out of it. So anyways, uh, we can all use whatever help that we can get. Um, and any questions? That's about it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Sharon. Anybody from the audience? Uh, this isn't a question as such, but in terms of the uh, cockatoo population in Hong Kong, I just wanted to say there is someone at the University of Hong Kong yes. who has been studying that for the last few years. So, Are really they still on it? Uh, she's, she is still is there. Is that true? Yeah. yes. Okay. Uh, right. She's still working with them in a slightly different capacity. But I'll give her a call. She's great. She she has actually worn my pangolin costume and been on our events. You walk around that. as a giant pangolin. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's yeah, great. She's still there, still working. Yeah. 
Because I, I have a feeling that, because, uh, you know, I, I have feelers out, and some of these people are the traders, even at Bird Street, and um, they're telling me that they're seeing less cockatoos out there. And and throughout Pockfulham and Kennedy Road, I've observed many cases, and I've got, you know, like, Kennedy Road, there's like a, um, a gas station, so the people that work there, they kind of call me when they see something, you know, and uh, there's only so much I can do. I mean, the but, survey she's doing, the, the population has been stable a lot of the time she's been doing them. But, okay. Uh, but it should be growing. It should be, yeah. Growing? <laughs> okay. All right. Yes, the factory, they've moved into uh, the woodland. It's okay. Yeah. They've moved into the woodland above uh, Hongi Terrace. Uh huh. There's, there needs to be one or two. Uh, three days ago, there was at least 60 in that. Wow. I will take a look. Yeah. What about Kowloon side or new territories? Anyone know? Because I, I thought that AFC <clears throat> was moving some of these birds off to new territories too. Okay, well, I'll go ask you. Thanks. Yeah. I don't think we have questions from Sumba as well, so thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.